Live and uncensored. Uncensored. Consider the annoying meme, the fatuous selfie, the convincing advert, the tune you can't get out of your head. But are you collecting and spreading these memes? Or is your mind and iPhone 5 simply a place for memes to grow, evolve, and spread like viruses? If so, what does that say about God, about the paranormal, and about your own free will? Beware, ladies and gentlemen, because tonight we're going to infect your mind with a replicator so insidious, so lethal, and so ridiculous, it can only be called Latopia After Dark. Tell your friends. Intelligent listening for dangerous minds. This is Latopia. This is Latopia. Latopia after dark. After dark. After dark. Good evening, everybody. I'm your host, Ian Wynn, the techno pagan octopus messiah, joined by the ever practical, always rational literary supermom, Dr. Allison Gardner. Hi. That makes me sound awfully um, straight down the line. Yes, but yes, hello. Is, is that your diagnosis, Doctor? <laughs> that would be it. That's the technical way of phrasing it. Also joined, as usual, by our producer who's never obtuse, or Mr. Peter Cox. Hi. Oh, God, you are so <laughs> slow tonight. <laughs> Just laid back. That's and right. tonight's special guest is none other than Oxford-educated former parapsychologist, secular Buddhist, and world-renowned mimeticist, Professor Susan Blackmore. Welcome to the show, Susan. Thank you. I don't know what you make me sound like, but... I oh, oh we're going to leave that up to you. Uh, we have lots of things to discuss tonight, but um, I was thinking, do I open with love? Do I open with fear? Love, fear? I'm an American. We're going to open with fear. So, if I get this right, genes replicate on the level of the flesh, memes replicate on the level of the mind or culture, and teams, your techn technology-assisted memes, are currently in the business of replacing us with our own technology because computers and phones are better replicators than we are stop, stop, susan stop, stop, susan stop wait hold on a sec are the robots worse. coming to get me and if so is it safer under the bed yes definitely you're not making me feel any better it, but the trouble is we're all in this together so or individually it might be safer under the bed or safer not to have any of these gadgets and not to be part of the modern world but we're all in this together. So the danger is that the um, the the teams, the the information flowing around out there in cyberspace, created causing to be created all these machines, is affecting the planet and affecting all of us. So actually, there's no way out. Okay. Now we tried to get you to come down to the studio in London, and you dug your heels in pretty hard. And I'm beginning to think now that maybe you're in Devon, stockpiling guns and canned food. What? Do you, <laughs> no, I'm what do you, not. What do, know, what do you know? What do you know that we river. don't? I'm on a river, so I've got a, a p perpetual source of water. And a perpetual could dry source out, of fear. But not very likely. I've got solar panels and things that I could go off grid. I grow loads of my own vegetables. We've got chickens and eggs and things like that. But ten we've got enough land we could have animals. Um, but then I guess people with guns would come and kill us. So, I mm, don't know. But I'm not well, into also, the Well, also, if thing. you were armed to the hilt and you wouldn't tell us, would you? Probably not. But it, it is a genuine life dilemma. I mean, if you believe that really tough times are ahead and there won't be enough food and there won't be enough of anything is it going to be the people with guns will win and then would somebody like me who is not really a gun violent kind of person change and say actually i want to live i'll go and shoot people or would you just say buddhist like oh so it is i'll die well the only the only difference between the buddhist and the survivalist is proper training susan we, we want to get into teams and whether they're whether they're actually coming to get us and going to kick off sort of a technologically led zombie apocalypse. But I'd like to back it up uh, a little bit. You are an Oxford educated parapsychologist. Yes. And you, uh, you eventually turned your back to became skeptic, uh, became a skeptic and now speak out against, against all sort of psychic powers and such as hokum. What, what led to that, that transformation? Well, what led to what led to the transformation um, was experiments. I mean, I'm a scientist. I think deep, deep down, I've always been a scientist. Like, you know, if I want to know the answer to something, I want to go and find out by experiment, by reading other people's experiments, by asking the universe questions about itself. What is it like? And having been convinced by my own strange experiences that there was telepathy and clairvoyance and precognition and ghosts and, and spirits and life after death and everything, I began to do experiments. And um, I didn't find any paranormal phenomena. So double-blind studies on the paranormal produced no results, so you figured 
that's it. Throw in the towel. It's not happening. <laughs> it wasn't quite as simple as that. <laughs> well, I mean, I, obviously, I've, I've only reduced 20 years of your life to 30 You've seconds. You've reduced 24 years. A little bit much. Let me just give it a little bit more flesh. Please. It was a, it's kind of like you, you turn this corner. Okay, I, I, I don't any longer think there's the clairvoyance. But what about telepathy? That might be different. Okay. I knew no, you were going to say that. Telepathy. Well, it still could <laughs> exist, but yeah. I'll carry on looking for it then what about ghosts i've slept in so many haunted houses and wasn't scared and nothing happened and and so on poltergeist i've been investigating poltergeist you know I, there was always seemed to be one more corner to go around okay but and eventually i came back to what started me off which was my own out of the body experience and investigated those which was really interesting because people lots of people have out of the body experiences where they seem to be out of the body, they're very interesting, can even be life-changing. But again, I found that they were not paranormal in origin. Nothing is actually leaving the body. It's a transformation within within your own head okay, of I, what's I've, going on. I've had so it wasn't a sudden, oh, there's nothing there, you know. It was a very gradual, and there came a point when I had to say, actually, I don't think there's anything in it, but I can't prove it. You know, I could still be proved wrong. I think there are no paranormal phenomena at all, but some experiment could come along and I'd be convinced and change my mind. All right. It hasn't done. I, I've, had, I, I've had it, I've had out of body experiences, both. Have both, you? Yes, both mm. sober and uh, under the influence. You had a very powerful out of body experience at the very beginning that sort of launched your whole journey. Well, it was my first term. Oh as yeah, a start with not. there I was. <laughs> there I was sitting in my friend's room. In fact, the same friend who was here all weekend and has just left. Sitting in my friend's room in St. Hilda's College in Oxford. Late at night, we'd had a Ouija board session all evening because I was running the Psychical Research Society of Oxford University. And um, I was tired. I'd been going to bed late, getting up for nine o'clock lectures, smoking some dope, um, uh -huh. sitting down, listening to probably Grateful Dead. Oh, it might come have been on Floyd. now. Um, and I was going in, in this kind of state that I was in, kind of sitting on the floor, you know, I was going down a dark tunnel towards a bright light. I'd never heard of tunnel experiences. I've had plenty since and lots of people have them, but I'd never heard of them. But then um, another friend said to me, um, where are you, Sue? Obviously, I must have looked a bit weird. Anyway, he said, where are you? And I struggled to work out where I was. And then everything became clear and it became so clear it was like more clear than ordinary life as though I was kind of a more awake than I had ever been and I was looking down on my body and my two friends and that body was talking saying what I wanted to say oh I'm on the ceiling looking down and I had heard at that stage of astral projection and my friend said to me oh it's astral projection and he kept talking to me and I think if he hadn't I would have had a typical out-of-body experience which lasts a couple of minutes, and then it's over. Did you have the sensation of kind of reaching back to your body and operating your tongue? No, no. It was more like I was somewhere else, but as I spoke, the mouth down there open and shut. So there was no connect, there was no umbilical cord. Yeah, there was. To begin there was. with, there was a cord, the, the silver cord. Yep, there was a cord, but it was just sort of floating between us as though it was like a boat anchored or something like that. Okay. But when I spoke, it was, you know... I felt that I up there was speaking and the voice was coming out down there. Extraordinarily strange thing. The weird thing is, this is 40 years ago and I can remember it so clearly. Well, they're life-changing events, as you just said. I'd like to throw this over to Ali. Ali, have you ever had an out-of-body experience? Uh, no, I haven't. I've had a couple of slightly odd psychic experiences where you just kind of, you're aware of somebody being in the room and you can't move type experiences. But no, no, I've, I've luckily I've stayed connected. How, how about patients? So, have you had any patients with, uh, um, who've had... I've had a, a couple of people I, I know quite well. Um, one of them, um, she nearly died from um, a postnatal hemorrhage, and she she did exactly she did the classical thing, the tunnel, and you know, feeling she was going to the other side, and actually at that point said, "I can't go. You know, I've got too much to do. I've just had a child. I've got to go back." The pressures of life brought her back. The pressures of life actually brought her back, but she said ever since then she's actually had no fear of dying, which I think is actually very common. That when people have had an out of body, I certainly felt uh, during my uh, during and after my out of body experience and coming back into my body, like whoa. What did you have? What uh, happened to you? Um, well, there were there were there were a number of occasions. Once I was in an ashram in India, d learning learning yoga, and I felt um, I felt an arm kind of come around my waist and say, mm. "Come on, let's let's." I had this very sensation of like, "Come on, let's go." And I'd been meditating, doing all this yoga, and it was very. I, I might have been smoking some dope, but that can't be proven. Um, 
And I felt the sort of at my waist, uh, some, some, something kind of tugged me out of my body, and I didn't want to go, and so I kind of clung to myself, yeah. and it pulled and it pulled, and I f- sort of, and then I was above my body, but my hands were still kind of clenched where my hands were, if that makes sense, and I, the, this force that was trying to get me to sort of fly was pulling me farther and farther away, and I clung to my body, and I could see it, and then it pulled, and then I actually pulled it off the bed, and I woke up as I was falling, and, uh, you know, land, land, landed on my arse. The Zoo is a brilliant first novel set in the high-pressure, cocaine fueled world of advertising. If you like Mad Men, you'll adore The Zoo. The Zoo is grippingly dark and ultimately moving, says Man Booker shortlisted author Alison Moore. Listen to an interview with author Jamie Mollett at the end of this show. Latopia.tv slash The Zoo. The Zoo. The Zoo. The Zoo. The Zoo. So what intrigues me is, is, you know, you've got two people here who report very interesting phenomena. You do too. How can you dismiss that so easily? Who's dismissing what? <laughs> well, you did. You, you started a few minutes ago. You are saying that, you know, you've been investigating. What? No, and, you know. no. I, I mean, let me challenge Ali. Ali said a psychic experience. What, what she described there, albeit very briefly, was, was sleep paralysis. Look, these experiences sure happen all the time. Something around 20% of people have out-of-body experiences, what I would call out-of-body experiences. Nothing leaves the body. There's no convincing evidence of anything leaving. There's no convincing evidence. There's evidence, but it really, I've tried hard. So what happened to you, things, Sue? Let, Please let me finish. That people are seeing things at a distance. It's so hard to make this case. That's why I'm insisting you let me speak. People seem to think either... It's really what it feels like and seems like and people want to believe, particularly religious people, i.e. your soul or your spirit has left and gone to some other place and can survive. Or you're dismissing it and you're saying it's rubbish or it's, you know. No, the truth, as as far as I can tell from decades of research and loads of experience myself, is these are really important, interesting, wonderful, life-changing experiences, but they're not paranormal. And, and until we can grasp that we don't have what, to what either they? dismiss them or treat them as paranormal, what, are we they don't get anywhere. Are, we, are you talking about chemicals in the brain? Is that, do you reduce things to basically a chemical reaction? Well, I don't. If you think about scientifically trying to understand something, you need to choose the appropriate level of reduction or, or expansion, or you need to explain them at the right level. Mm-hmm. The chemical level is not going to be very helpful, although, of course, it will. there will be chemical processes going on in synapses. I think the appropriate level to understand the out-of-body experience is that we know which area of the brain is disrupted when they happen. And it's called the temporoparietal junction. It's kind of here. And it's an area which is involved in constructing the body image. And it's taking information from vision, from hearing, from touch, from smell, from indeed from all the senses and putting them together to make a representation of where your body is, what you're doing. So I'm kind of waving my arms around now. Um, all that is tracked by this part of the brain. Now, that functions perfectly fine most of the time. But we know that in certain conditions it's disrupted. You can put, in rare cases, you can put an electrode in, you can cause an out-of-the-body experience by stimulating that particular spot. So is this um, is this akin to dreams? Would you put them on the same level as dreams? No, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't because... The brain state in dreams is very particular and there are four main stages plus REM sleep and they're very distinct. You can see them very clearly. What little information we have about out-of-the-body experiences are people are not asleep. We don't have much evidence of people, um, even with EEG, although there's some, there's very little on scans, but they're not asleep on the whole. They're either in a um, kind of hypnopompic, hypnagogic state on the edge of sleep or much more likely they're wide awake. The brain is functioning in an awake way but something has caused this body image area to malfunction. So in near-death experiences, for example, you might have um, a flood of endorphins, you might have a flood of um, uh, um, dopamine, other other, um, things will be going on in there, or you'll have a lack of oxygen. Any of these things can cause hyperactivity, you know, massive random firing. And that will cause this experience. That leads me straight into how I was originally introduced to your work by a man by the name of Terence McKenna. And uh, he was, uh, he, he... he was very fond of the idea of, of memes, and, and I'm going to try to do his voice justice of uh, what, is, uh, what is imagination but meme mutation in action. And he recommended your work, and uh, when I first met him, the whole conversation turned into DMT and the experiences that he'd had out there. And he used to talk about meeting self-transforming elf machines and beings on astral planes. And he would even entertain the idea that these creatures he encountered were, were memes. 
Uh, you've had ex- I've had experiences. I wrote a novel about my experiences with DMT. You you've tried DMT. This is di- I haven't. This is di- dimethyltryptamine. Have have you tried Have you tried? Yeah, I've only had it twice, and that was smoked. So uh, DMT is the is the active ingredient in ayahuasca. I have never had ayahuasca with the whole proper ceremonial. Either I would love I. to do that. Yeah. The only time I've had DMT, um, it was smoked. I've been very, very lucky in my life to have really good drug guides. You know, I've not, uh, on the whole, had stupid experiences like, um, sadly, so many yeah. kids do because drugs are prohibited and illegal and criminal and everything else. And also, DMT is not a party drug. drug guidance. But I had this fantastic helper who gave me this stuff, and he told me two important things. He said, one, one of his friends who'd had DMT said it was the worst thing that had ever happened to him in his life. And during the 15 or 20 minutes of it being active, uh, he thought that nothing that ever happened again in his life could ever make up for anything so terrible. So that was kind of good expectation. Okay. And the second thing he said was, um, take what you would take one puff of this pipe and that'll be fine. And then you'll take the second puff and you will drop it. Um, and you're leaning against the wall and the cushion and everything. That's fine. You'll drop it. I'll pick it up. Don't worry. You'll be fine. So off I went. And it was, I've had loads and loads of different drugs, but this one was really uh, the most extreme. Some people say it's like an acid trip of eight hours condensed into 15 minutes. Yeah. I mean, the whole world just went. (laughs) (laughs) Do you remember the landscape? Of that particular DMT experience, I was sitting on the floor in my own study and in front of me were the legs of the billiard table, which are kind of like um, spiral carved wood. And these spirals began to move completely. And then spirals went everywhere and colors, pink and green, very, very bright. And then I was off into other worlds. And I can't really remember that. Unlike the out of the body experience, which was absolutely clear and I can still remember, I don't remember very much other than saying to myself, go with it. I yeah, mean, the training from stuff. years of meditation and lots of drugs is always go with it, take it as it comes. And and then I started laughing and I, and I said, <laughs> I was really grinning and laughing and saying, Terrible, terrible. <laughs> it's the most terrible thing that's ever happened with a big grin. That's you know? hilarious. Do you think the experience had any value? Um, yes, but little. I would say it's probably its main value was what I just described, the ability to take massive disruption of everything in your brain with equanimity, that's some kind of training. But I, I wouldn't say, I would say the drugs that really are of value would be LSD, mescaline, maybe MDMA. Um, I I wouldn't say that that, that that DMT experience had great value, but I would like to try ayahuasca with proper preparation. It's not for everyone, for sure. No, 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 no. What, it int- no. what intrigues me about and what intrigued me about what Terence had to say was there was a huge commonality of experience and people describing a... Uh, these these beings that he encountered in describing this kind of fractal landscape. If anyone's ever seen the work of Alex Gray, who's been on DMT, you yeah. kind of go, oh, yeah, that's, uh, yeah. yeah, I've been there. It's like that. And yep. uh, it makes me wonder, like, why, if this is all just synapses firing, can't be proven that the spirit leaves the body, etc., why do humans appear to be hardwired for these mystical states? It's a very interesting question that I have struggled with and don't have an answer to. I mean, the main two kinds of answers would be, there's some value to this in people's lives. It has held groups together, helped people survive in some way. There's some, there's some e- evolutionary reason that we don't haven't found. Or it could simply be a byproduct of the breakdown of systems which had evolved for other reasons. We don't know. And it's so hard to do the research because you can't get licenses to do it. Mm. And oh, one day we'll know. It's, but all, I, anec- I don't it's know. all anecdotal right now because they're not allowed yep. to study. Yeah. Yeah. Ian, were you really asking why does everybody go to the same place? Well, from my experience, mm-hmm. I've very much felt that, and, and it was DMT that basically said to me, like, okay, you need to stop taking drugs now. Like, that was the last trip, was kind of like, okay, you've been here, you've seen that, now, you know, go. Essentially, DMT is the helicopter that shows you the, the summit and then drops you back off at base camp and says, start walking. And... Uh, I felt very much that it was a place. It wasn't so much a drug as it was a vehicle. It's unlike any other experience I've ever had. It, it was a, a space shuttle. It took you somewhere. And that, that place, there's a huge commonality of the way people describe the landscape in terms of the, the patterns, the fabric, the, um, and the, the these self-dribbling jeweled basketballs that come up to you and you know, show you the... Uh, I don't know, the reality gnomes, working reality with crystal levers. People who've been on DMT are like, yeah, yeah, I can kind of see where that might might come from. 
but it, we're talking about 0.0001% of the population who even who even dabbles with these and and I'm just I, I'm curious with with Sue as she's had an out of body experience and she's been to these astral states and yet she went through many years trying to sort of prove their existence and, and eventually came up and said you know actually this is not happening <laughs> So you mean she's been to the astral places which don't exist? Yeah. I mean, it w- look, you're yeah, doing it again. <laughs> I don't say the experiences don't exist. Loads of people have the experiences. The experiences happen. It's just that nothing's leaving the body. Sure. Doesn't that make sense? It does. But I thought you'd, you yourself had actually do not believe in the astral planes. Is that not correct? Astral That's bodies correct. And astral yes. Planes? I don't think there are astral planes. Yeah. I think what there are, you were talking about this going to the same place. I mean, uh, uh, something that came to mind there was when people get blind, usually in, in later life and they become blind rather slowly and then, then their the brain changes because there isn't the visual information coming in, a lot of them begin to see little tiny creatures like sort of gnomes digging like, you know, Snow White and whatever. And lots of little creatures. I mean, we do not know exactly why, but something is happening in the way that you're not getting enough visual information in. The brain is giving over those parts of the brain to do some other job and you get these funny little creatures. We don't understand it very well, but it's not just with with hallucinogenic drugs that you get this strange phenomenon that brains under certain conditions will produce the same no, hallucinations. Ter- Terence used to call a DMT meditation as advertised, and I'm not asking you as a scientist, Sue. I'm asking you as a person and as as a as a human. I'm asking your heart. Do you believe there's a higher organizational force, a, a higher intelligence than than human? No, if you mean let one me, that... Let me rephrase. Have you experienced one? I've experienced what feels like guidance, yes. But I think that guidance is coming from a lifetime of experiences. But I, I don't know for sure. And it is very strange when you have those experiences. But I do think it's... that. We, we've evolved out of, you know, the whole universe has, has, is full of things evolving, complexity evolving by, by natural selection. And that's how we got here and that's how our brains got here. Not that there's somebody guiding it, no. But those experiences, feeling you're guided, are interesting. Would you agree with Donald Rumsfeld in that there are unknown unknowns? <laughs> Of course, there are lots and lots of unknown <laughs> unknowns. Science, in a way, is the whole process of uncovering unknown unknowns because every time you make some great step forward in science and you suddenly understand something new or better than you did before, it opens up new questions. They are questions that you wouldn't have asked before. I mean, all these questions we ask about how the brain works. And, I mean, I'm particularly interested in in all sorts of... Uh, near-death experience would be an example of a cascading series of experiences and we're trying to understand why you get the tunnel first and then the out-of-body experience and then like whatever it is um now we're not understanding this but the now we're asking questions about well is that a cascade of chemicals is that what what's going on questions we could not have even asked before so those would have been unknown unknowns they're now known unknowns but there'll be plenty more unknown ones so yeah i mean i didn't like the way he said it particularly but yeah <laughs> This is Roger Scruton. You can hear me on The Gary Bushell Show here on our wonderful Radio Litopia. Here comes the future. This brings us neatly to what, you're, what you've become quite famous for as being a memeticist. Most people think they know what a meme is, in that it's, they might even know it's a replicator, that it acts on the level of culture and the mind, the way genes act on the level of the flesh. But what do people get wrong about memes? Like, especially young people, like, what do you hear when people discuss memes that make you go, no, you you don't have it right? A meme is any information that is copied from person to person or person to book or any technology to a person. So it's information that is copied. We know that for any evolutionary process to get going, you need three things. You need copying, you need copying with variation, and you need heredity or cop- or um, passing on the information. And you have that with cultural things like stories, um, ways of doing things, driving on the left or the right, um, financial institutions, scientific theories. All these things are information that's copied from person to person. And many of the copies go extinct. And some of the others get copied many, many times with variations and the variations get selected. So it's exactly the same process as happens with genes, but it's operating with culture 
with our ideas, our speaks, our stories, and so on, so on. Is this a metaphor you're using, or do memes really exist? Do they have tangential existence? Me- memes really exist in this sense. Um, Every word in your language is a meme. Every story you've ever heard, every song you've ever sung, they are memes. But if you're the saying that, if you're saying that everything, be, everything is a meme, should, then it has no meaning, does it? The, the question should not be, do they exist? The question should be, is it useful to look at the world that way? So I'm looking here at, at this laptop. You know, that, as far as I'm concerned, is a mass of memes, all information that has been copied by humans and factories and everything else. Now... There's no question that this laptop exists. If anything exists, this laptop exists. But the, the, the difficult question is, is that a useful way of looking at the world? I think it is. Most scientists think it isn't. Now, I want to go to that question that you asked earlier, which was, what do people get wrong? Um, one of the things they get wrong, but it doesn't bother me in the least, really, is that they popularly say um, a meme is something that spreads virally on the internet. Um, and they think that the only memes there are are these, you know, mega successful viral memes. Well, it's not true. Nigerian said, 419 scams memes too. But those are memes. And most people who talk about that in popular culture, they've got the idea right. They know it's something that's copied with variation and the ones that succeed and you get like the, you know, selfieing yourself with no makeup at the moment and giving money to cancer research or whatever it is. You know, these things spread virally. They are memes indeed. Other people get it wrong, and this is much more worrying, that they don't understand that it's just applying evolutionary theory to the stuff of culture. And if they don't understand that and they don't see the importance of copying, then they'll say, well, a meme's only the same as an idea. No, some ideas are memes, some aren't. What you makes, know, that's you, the can I just ask you, what simple. makes evolutionary theory appropriate for interpreting sociology? I mean, why? I can, I can understand you making that jump, but why is it a valid thing to do? Um, maybe it isn't. I find, I, when I read The Selfish Gene, you know, 40 years ago or whatever, it's like it turned my world inside out. Suddenly I could understand why trees are the shape they are, why animals are like, because you, when you take the genes I view, a whole lot of things make sense that didn't make sense before. Now, it's not the be all and end all of understanding evolution, but it's a critical step. And I have the same experience when I suddenly got it about memetics. Ah, look around my study here, all these things. Why are these curtains here? Why is this carpet here? Why is this desk the shape it is? These are the winners in an evolutionary competition. This seemed to me to open my eyes and suddenly help me to ask more unknown, un- I mean, more known unknowns and more questions about the way the world works. And I think now I've been working on, on memetics for 15 years or something now i think we're going to need it as we're moving forward the transformations in technology since then have been phenomenal and i think we really are going to need memetics i think what i think what peter many people argue it's rubbish i think what peter's asking is is how are memes not just a clever way to a clever metaphor for explaining genetics like for for me i when i read the selfish gene i was uh, t- having an under, taking my undergraduate degree in biology and it accumulated in sociobiology it was probably one of my favorite courses and it it ended with um a motive need not be conscious for it to exist and that kind of blew my mind and opened it up like it doesn't matter what I think about genes. They're just replicating. And this is the way flesh spreads and mutates yeah. and changes and becomes so complex. Yeah, but you're talking about genes. And, yes, but, and, but that's... You know, we're that, talking about memes. I understand. I mean, genes have but coding, this is, but don't I, they? I'm bringing, genes are coded and memes are not. They have no information well, that I, makes them reproduce. Well, this is... Yes, they do. But this of course is, they do. Where is it? Where, they where have is it our brains. Where is our it? brains are meme machines. That's what they do. They take in information, they mix it up with other information that they've already got, and they put out new information and they pass it on. That's what I'm doing now. This brain up here is taking the words in, mixing them up with everything else, coming up with answers, putting them out. These, these memes, these words I'm speaking now will be going out to I don't know how many thousands of people if they want to watch it or listen to it. And th- those memes will spread. And they'll it sounds like intelligent them, design to me. It sounds awfully close to intelligent design. Why? How, how so? No. No, the memes are just information spreading. They are using our brain. They're but they don't like, want to. I mean, you're, as, kind, as of, you're kind of injecting personality. You're raising No, 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 no. Wait, you're hold on. You're turning into things that oh. want to reproduce. And they clearly don't want to because they don't have any existence, really. Do In they? that sense, it's concepts. exactly the same as genes. I think I mean, evolutionary if you get it for ha- genes, you'll get it for memes. And if you don't, you won't. I mean... Of course, selfish genes are not going, I want to replicate. Well, this, and this is the point. There's no, 
There's mm-hmm. no ulterior motive. I think that that's what gets misunderstood, both about genetics and, if I understand it correctly, about memetics. There is no, there is no agenda. These things aren't trying to mutate. Correct. All they want to do, all they, it's not even want. All they yep. do is replicate. All they exactly. do, that's it. That's the end. Genes, they all they do the is replicate. Without if, the responsibility or the knowledge or the insight or anything else. They have the power because they are information competing and we do the selecting. So we choose which stories to pass on, which books to read, which um, programs to watch, which websites to look at. We're, we're doing all that, but they have the power because they're, they're just replicating and copying and we select amongst it just It seems really strange to me. And I'm thinking back to the history of science where people had to create something like ether for uh, light waves to propagate and then there was phlogiston which was a valid scientific concept for some time you know which allowed things to combust and now we've got this you know rather difficult to pin down concept called memes that allow ideas to reproduce and spread according to evolutionary theory I think you've got it completely wrong. The analogy you're using do. about phlogiston and caloric fluid and all of those, I would say is more like consciousness. I think consciousness is like those. We think there is this thing called consciousness, but really we're kind of getting it wrong. Memes, I hope I've already said this, but it's just a new way of looking at things that we already deal with all the time, with words and stories and ways of doing things and technologies. But you've just said it's not a metaphor. It's a new way of understanding them in the same way that understanding biology in terms of genes transformed much for the better our understanding. This is a new way of understanding culture. So what you're saying is that... may not be useful, but I think it is. That memetics is a way of understanding culture, and in that way, it's useful. It's not even a debate over whether they exist or not. It's a way of looking at the world. And if you look at the world this way... Okay, how is it useful? I mean, Well, if it was really useful, it would have spread like anything, and there would be departments of memetics everywhere, and there aren't. So this is why I say it may all <laughs> prove to go nowhere. So I it itself is it a is, meme. So is, it, is, it, is memetic yep. theory useful? At the moment, I haven't found any great uses other than the, that I'm concerned about the spread of technology, the fact that it is going faster and faster, and I think we do need memetics to understand it, but I'm very much in a minority, and right, I could be- turn out to be before wrong. Before we move on to the, the technological thing, I would just like to kind of flip a, a meta switch, if if you'll permit me, and that is to say how... Can I stop you? <laughs> oh, I, I don't know. You, you Nobody can, can stop no, you. No, no, it's kind of a no. st- steamroll. I'll try, I'll try to keep it short, though, if that matters to anybody. Um, how... Maybe memes are just a really clever way for genes to replicate. Like we're using, like if we're really good at at at, at replicating memes, that that benefits us genetically, and therefore the whole concept of using memes is uh, it raises my inclusive fitness. See, see where I'm going that, with that? That is. Um that is a way of describing all the other much more popular theories in science of cultural evolution. So there are lots and lots of um, meme gene co culture gene, gene culture co-evolution theories, dual inheritance theories they're called. There are several theories of that kind. And they say that basically culture does evolve. Some people say it doesn't, but these people will say culture does evolve, but it evolves for the sake of the genes because the genes are the ultimate replicator. Memetics is different, for, oh, excuse me, memetics is different from that because it says, no, memes are a replicator in their own right and they don't care about the genes, they don't care about us, they don't care about anything because they can't because they're just information that's being copied um, and therefore they may or may not be good for the genes. Now, if memes are really bad for the genes, then the people carrying them will die out so they will have a co-evolution with the genes but then when you've got a stable, you know, you've got a planet with all these billions of people on it and all this massive amount of memes going around, they'll probably kill off some people but we've got so many now, we've pulled through some kind of bottleneck and we are supporting, we're managing to support this massive evolving culture. Hello, I'm Eric Beckrubin, hardcore out of control book enthusiast, inviting you to listen to a new show here on Latopia called Burning Books. Every three weeks, we put out a new podcast on a single book. It could be a recent debut, a classic, fiction, nonfiction, and everything in between. The idea is to explore what lies at the heart of great books, books that try to be great but don't quite make it, as well as, now and then, books that are irredeemably bad. So check out our archive shows on Litopia, and we'll look forward to having you join us for our next podcast. Burning Books, exclusively from Litopia.com. 
So I want to ask you about teams, because this is a development of meme theory, and it seems to be going in a fairly scary way. Tell us about it. My thinking went like this. I, I was asked to write about cultural evolution in the cosmos, which was an odd thing. NASA were doing a book on it and wanted me to write about it. And I never thought about it. And I thought, well, what are the implications for any planet that gets any replicator and then gets another replicator? So on this planet, we've got genes first and then memes. Could there be another replicator? And I began thinking seriously about that. And the way it's worked with the first two is you've got genes building bodies, um, you know, animals and brains and things. Those brains then start copying by imitation, by speaking and throwing ideas backwards and forwards. That's how they produced another replicator. Could that happen again? And I looked around at all these computers and the internet and everything else, and I thought, hang on a minute, those computers and that software out there is almost, it's on the verge of doing all the three processes of copying with variation and selection. It's doing those three um, by itself. I mean, we've, we've built the computers in the first place, but this information is now taking off out there in But how are, how, are, how are these things a third replicator? Aren't they just weaponizing the second? Well, in a way, they're building on the second replicator in the same way that the second replicator built on the first. That's, that's my logic. And I really, I mean, this is all kind of exploratory, just ideas that I'm playing with. This is with. Rise of the Robots. This is where I start to get really scared. Yeah, I mean, seriously, you, you do have the guns and the canned food down there, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> she is I broadcasting from food, under the bed. I haven't yes. got the guns. Well, you would, like I said, you wouldn't tell us if you would. It just seems like if, if memes are... are operating and replicating on the level of the mind and genes are, are are operating and replicating on the level of the flesh where am i where is free will what where is the space for for me to be me uh, you can be you but i don't think you have free will you will be you because you have unique genetic uh, origins you have unique upbringing you have n unique m memes that you've come across and mixed up and thrown out so you are a unique person but free will I don't think so. Okay, okay, but I want to call you on this because I, I was listening to a podcast where I think it was called The Secular Buddhist. I, I'm sort of a novice meditator, and there you were talking about your, your meditative meditation practice, which you do, yes? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I've been meditating every day for more than 30 years. Okay, so if you meditate, you're focusing on nothing, and you're putting all those thoughts, which are sort of replicating memes, battling each other to get out of your face, and you're suppressing them. Well, what's suppressing them? No, I'm not suppressing them. <laughs> when you create nothing, the, the goal of meditation is to create nothing, to think nothing, be nothing, to just be. Who's, who's doing the being? If not okay. you. Okay, it's a valid question, but I just want to correct something about meditation. I mean, my training is in Zen. It's actually in Chan, which is the um, Chinese precursor to um, Zen. I'm not a Buddhist, but I've been meditating for a long time. Uh, and the goal is not, it's not nothing. It, it's learning to be, to sit, or in Zen we say just sitting. Yeah. You're not just sitting with nothing. You're just sitting with the bird song, the sound of the radiators, the feel of your bum on the on the seat. Oh my God, I've been doing All it wrong. Things are there. It's not nothing. It's not Damn things. it, do you know how hard it's been to do to get this far and I've been doing it wrong all the time? I've just yeah, been trying yeah. to shut it I, down. I, you do it wrong endlessly, you do it wrong endlessly, and eventually it begins to calm down so that you can sit and there's just the bird song and you're not saying, oh, I wonder if that's a blackbird or a chaffinch. There's nothing, there's no thinking going on, but there is stuff, it's not nothing. But there are different forms of meditation anyway. But you asked the question. Well, I've written this book called Zen and the Art of Consciousness in which I ask various questions, one of which is, who is meditating? And it's just practice at letting go. If you but who's doing the practice? Meditation, it's letting if go. If there's no free will, who's doing the practice? Right. Well, in the beginning, there is an illusory person who thinks they're in charge, who thinks they're doing it. And it ha seems that it has to be that way. But that begins to fall away and then comes just happening. Now, I mean, the trouble is, you, you've come at this through meditation, but I came at no free will as a teenager, looking at the science then, which is terrible like parents now, of thinking there can't be free will. Everything this body does here is caused by something that went before. So if I think I'm doing it, who's the I? I look inside, like David Hume, like endless people, like the Buddha, you look inside and I can't find a me who's doing it. I tell a story that there's a me who's doing it. But I've this thing here has stopped telling that story quite a long time ago. Definitions, isn't it? It's definitions of how you define I and me in inner consciousness, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And I yeah, define yeah. me as differently than um, you because <laughs> Now Ali, I tell me how you do it then. <laughs> Ali, you describe Ali, you describe yourself as an atheist, wouldn't you? Me, I, me, I don't know to be honest. You don't, so we're agnostic. Agnostic. Yeah. Sue, would you describe yourself as a 
as as a, as an as an atheist. Yes. So, but is that is that of your own free will, Sue, that you choose that? <laughs> no, no, I'm uh, no. <laughs> this this that was chosen not, for you based on a collection of experiences. Pun. That was chosen for you based on a collection of experiences and genetics that popped out an a- an atheist. Yeah, I wouldn't say it was chosen for me. It happened. It happened. Yeah, here it is. Yeah, There's no, there is no guiding hand, whether your own or other. But you said you were open to someone proving the existence of the paranormal. You were open to someone proving that that memes actually, you know, that they could be fleshed out, so so to speak. You're yeah. open. You're open. Yes. Well, that that colors you an agnostic. There's if there's still hope, even if it's a tiny tiny grain. In those senses, yes. But as an atheist, I I take an atheist. Being an atheist to mean I live without the concept of God, I live without any hope of God or life after death or anything like that. That's how I live my life, without God. Atheist. That's how I live. Okay. That's, ha- more a, that's agnostic, really, isn't it? Well, you could say that, but then I think if oh, you Oh, she that, just did, You're yo. left with not being able to say anyone's an atheist, really, except the most closed-minded no, person. That can't be. absolutely you know? don't believe. Whereas agnostics Pardon? actually don't believe well, in the way, don't our they? Our friend... I mean, our friend Richard Dawkins here. I mean, I absolutely adore his 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 work, but he's he's a militant fundamentalist yeah. atheist, and I just yeah. I sort of I, I disapprove of people who say they have the answer to what it all means because well, I re- I really think all that that's I say unknowable. Is I live without that idea. I don't I don't think you don't even I, ask that I question. Don't... Hmm? You don't even ask that question. What whether sometimes there's a God. not even well, whether there's a God, started, but like what's going on. What's happening There's only here? so many questions I can devote my life to, and whether there's a God or not doesn't seem to be one of the interesting ones. I'm quite happy to say there isn't. There's so many concepts and the Bible and the It's not Quran asking whether so there's a God. It's, it's, asking, it go. I, it's not asking whether there's a God. It's just asking what's happening. Like what's, no, what's really going time. on? Yeah, yeah, what is this? What's happening? I ask that all the time, that's, all the time. And that's the, that's the question that I find myself asking after an out-of-body experience, after yeah. I read a scientific paper, after I, you know, watch. It's like the other day I was on the tube and there were all these uh, headphones on, the, um, on the, the, the adverts, you know, all the, uh, the television screens. And they had all different color, candy-colored headphones going up. And then two months later, the, the adverts were down. But everyone was wearing those same multicolored headphones. And with the, from a meme point of view, I was like, okay, something's like, okay, it's good advertising. But, you know, I, th- I want to know what's going on. What, how does it that a seed gets planted in my mind and then suddenly I'm, I'm wearing this, you know, a candy-colored yeah. green headphone? Yeah, that's but a brilliant example to. of a meme spreading. And I'm like you. I, I would be asking exactly the same questions. Yeah. So, so you're focusing on what's going – you're taking the microscope and looking at reality. You're happy to do that. And if it comes up with a higher being or some, a, a higher level of consciousness, you're okay with that. Yes. Um, yes. Yes. So if the alien spaceship landed in your backyard, just to be clear, you'd get on and go somewhere. Oh, I'm not sure I'd get on, but I'd certainly take an interest. I might get on. I don't know. We'll have to see if it happens. But I have had some amazing experiences um, relating to aliens. I mean, once I was at the University of the West of England in Bristol, where I worked, and um, this guy turned up and he said he wanted to interview me about something or other, um, uh, sleep paralysis. And he turned up and he did a very nice little interview. And then he said at the end, um, uh, I have had sleep paralysis and I've been abducted by aliens and I can tell you they're wrong and they're different. And I've got an implant in my mouth um, that I took out. I've got one too. It cost about (laughs) £4,000. What, the surgery? (laughs) Ali, how much does it cost to remove? If if the aliens implant something in me, depending on the area, obviously, give me a rough price estimate on what it takes to, to get it out. I think about 500 quid as long as it's a relatively easy surface to get at. The inside of the mouth should be dead easy. Okay. All right. Well, I'll be, sh- you know, I will ask around and uh, check the witch sure. and see, make opinion. sure I get a second opinion. I want to get yeah. a good deal on that when, when it happens. Uh, Sue, so one, one last point. Uh, so what's to say that after studying memes for 24 years that you'll give it up like you did parapsychology as a bunch of hokum and next thing you'll be lecturing and researching and writing books on another hard-to-prove experimental <laughs> fabric of In the universe. In 24 years, I shall be 86. I don't think... <laughs> you I'm won't even care. You. You'll throw in the towel at the much. rest of us um, who've been following meme theory and you won't even care. I, probably, yeah, yeah. I'll just take some more drugs and enjoy my very old age. But I think it's possible that I may... 
things you know come to the fore of my research and go in 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 in, in the background i would say i've not been working that much on memes for a while but i've suddenly been invited to go to a fascinating thing at the santa fe institute um a whole week discussing cultural evolution and i've started to get excited about memes again if it gets nowhere if no useful scientific questions or practical questions come out of memetics i'll probably gradually think it's not worth doing but something may happen i don't know some other idea might might come to me some other memes might infect me just like the idea of memes infected me in the first place uh, back in 1996 when i was ill in bed for a year with chronic fatigue and i just read the meme i read um, the selfish gene again and i just got thinking about memes oh, not of my own free will you understand right. cool. not happen. of your own free will i don't know what will happen no. next well, uh, Sue, so I have one. I have one more question for you, and that is, uh, we're relaunching here on Latopia After Dark. We're doing a reboot, changing up our website, and uh, we've got some great guests lined up and so forth. Can you give us any advice on how to weaponize the uh, this particular meme of Latopia After Dark? This is for our producer. <laughs> No, uh, I, I think if I knew that, I would be extremely rich. Um, I, did a, I did a radio program for Radio 4 about um, internet memes, and uh, I interviewed quite a few advertising people, and they were all wanting to know, you know how, to <laughs> how to get, get the, head, to how to get the candy-colored headphones <laughs> off the wall and onto people. Unbelievable. I, and and one, one, uh, I, say, I keep saying one last thing, but would you consider this, and it's my little gift to you, Sue, would you consider changing the word teams of t technology assisted means to, are you ready? You ready? Ready. Crystal methamphetamines. <laughs> I consider it. <laughs> All right. Well, if, if you'll do that and at least uh, uh, acknowledge me on the, in the next book. We've been right, talking. Yeah, I'll put your name on it. Copyright Sue, you. Professor Blackmore, Susan, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I regret to inform you that uh, your mind has been infected with meme theory, with Professor Susan Blackmore, with my unfortunate lack of hairstyle, with uh, Peter's kind of dubious editing, and with... Uh, Ali's terminal diagnosis. If it makes you feel any better, think of these things as, I don't know, replicating highly contagious airborne brain worms for which there is no cure. Please proceed right to on. please proceed to latopia.com for quarantine and don't forget, please be sure to tell your friends I I hear the internet is good for that. Good night everybody. Thanks so much Sue for joining us. Good night. Good night. Good night. Pleasure. It was fun. I want to tell you about The Zoo, a brilliant first novel set in the high-pressure, cocaine fueled world of advertising. Written by Jamie Mollett, published by Sandstone Press, The Zoo follows the rise and then fall of James Marlowe, a brilliant and successful account director who's just won a big piece of new business. The account is for a major international bank. It's just what every ad man dreams of. But for Marlowe, it's just the start of his personal nightmare. I spoke to author Jamie Mollett, and the first question I asked him was, why is your name so similar to your protagonists? Okay, so we've got this advertising director whose name is not entirely <laughs> <laughs> dissimilar to yours. I noticed the J.M. Jamie Mollett. Your your protagonist is called what? James Marlowe. Yeah. I know, I know, it's similar. It would, it was, it's a kind of, it started off as kind of a joke, but it is actually um, Henry James. The lead character is a is a um, is a very unreliable narrator, and obviously, Turn of the Screw is the most famous unreliable narrator and the Marlowe comes from um, Heart of Darkness Have you considered suing yourself perhaps for a defamation? <laughs> I, I thought it was funny to have the initials JM and then I sort of realised afterwards that uh, everyone will ask me that question <laughs> Okay so your protagonist is morally conflicted he, he becomes increasingly morally conflicted He does um, He is a creative director of, um, of an agency an unnamed agency and he wins an account for a large a large bank which of course to start with is, is a great thing and is sort of the pinnacle of his career but he discovers through friends and through the internet that this bank is involved in funding um, blood minerals in an African country. And that begins to play on his conscience. In case you don't know, blood minerals are Colton and Cassiterite, which are two minerals which are used to make phones and things like Playstations. And they are, they're almost exclusively mined in, in 
some countries in Western Africa and in very bad conditions, but they are absolutely integral to everything that we use today to communicate. So they're extremely valuable. So every time you buy an iPhone or something like that, you're actually supporting this trade? By one step removed. Mm. Um, and in this instance, I chose that one step removed to be a bank um, because, again, it was, a, it was a nice metaphor for consumerism and it seemed, it seemed a way to link the two things and together. And let's face it, who likes banks? Nobody. Um, <laughs> one, of, one of my concerns in writing this, actually, because you know how long it takes to write a book and then to get it published, was yeah. that the it wouldn't be um, part of the zeitgeist anymore. But they just keep shaming themselves. Yeah, they so, do, don't they? Yeah, and and I was I was really worried that they it would kind of all go away. But no, HSBC step up and and manage. Well, to do you were this. really worried the banking crisis would be over and we'd all suddenly find banks <laughs> lovable, cuddly koalas. I kind of thought that. They might get some comeuppance and people would be satisfied with it, but they appeared to, they got away with the entire banking crisis and almost collapse of our of our economic structure. Yeah, and then and then we find out they've been doing more things, and still there appears to be no culpability. So, what sort of book is this? Is this a depressing book? No, it's um, it's about redemption. Really, it is about him realizing what the effect he has in the world, the, the effect that we all have in the world, and finding his way back to being a decent person. And he it, 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 it could have just as easily been a banker um, or a solicitor or or anybody who gets put in this situation. But uh, it worked nicely for me to put this in a world of consumerism because that's something that everybody understands. Yeah, it is. And it also, interestingly, we are all just that little bit conflicted, aren't we? I mean, we all love our iPhones or our iPads or whatever. We all know that the conditions are made and in China are yeah. not, not brilliant. We wouldn't want to work there. We wouldn't want our kids to, to work in these places that have suicide nets, for God's sake, to stop people from killing themselves. That's terrifying, isn't it? Isn't it? But at the same time, you know, are we going to sort of not have our iPhones and things? No, no we're not. And I just think we all deal with it by not thinking about it. And he's put in a position where he has to think about it. And yeah. So that not thinking about it, actually, is the beginning. I mean, it stays there for most people, but it actually is kind of the beginning of a split mind, of a schizophrenic approach towards towards living, isn't it? Completely. I mean, we, we completely deny the fact that, that, well, we spend all our times on our phones and we never think about where they come from or how they got there, mm. um, all the people that were employed in making it. And, and I didn't even know about these minerals until I started looking at it, and that just added a whole, a whole other dimension for me of just how it's easy for us to forget about how these things happen when they're on another continent and it's and it happens one step, well, at least one step removed. It's funny, actually, in, in today's connected world, you would think, actually, that there is no, no such thing as one step removed anymore. <laughs> well, there isn't with the, <laughs> through the people we want to talk to, but I think, I think the, the way we've, we've set ourselves up is that we can, we can quite happily be connected to everybody in the world by, through six degrees of separation and Kevin Bacon and all of that, but the, the underlying... Um, the way that these these things are set up for us and the damage that they cause, we can very easily forget. Yeah. So what sort of research did you do for this? So I spent time on on a range of, of uh, mental health wards and I got to meet a lot of people, meet nurses, meet doctors and meet uh, patients themselves uh, across from, ver- from very open wards right up to the very sort of secure ones and met, met some really, really interesting people. And, what sort and of typically, what sort of people would these be? They're just like me and you. <laughs> It's, it seems very easy for somebody to get from being completely, in inverted commas, normal to yeah. being in a situation where they're not able to, to, to cope. Why do you call the book The Zoo? The, the Zoo is um, a set of figurines that the lead character has when he is in the um, mental health wards, um, which are toy figures. So there's a whole, there's a range of them, um, from a cowboy, a knight, um, a, a lion, um, an ape, um, and a whole, a whole range of them, which, which he's just dubbed The Zoo. Why would I read this book? <laughs> oh my god because you're my friend <laughs> <laughs> am i how am i going to feel after reading the zoo it's a serious book but i want it but i, I want it i want you to feel there's issues behind it but i wanted it i always wanted it to be entertaining as well i didn't want you to feel that you've been preached at i wanted you to, to be swept along by what happens to him he's a difficult character um he could not be very likable and i was very I wanted him to be people to be able to see themselves in him and be swept along by what was happening to him. Hopefully, I've achieved that. Mm. Um, Alison Moore, who wrote the the lighthouse, said that it intrigued her from the from the very first page. And and I wanted somebody. I wanted you to get to the end of it and understand if your life does disintegrate, there is a way out of it. Jamie, you're you're an advertising man. Tell me where this book fits on the shelf. It's contemporary fiction. It's modern contemporary fiction. Hopefully, sparsely written, exciting, and page turning. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm going to say I'd like to I'd like it to sit next to Brett Easton Ellis. Jamie, this is your first book. Um, how did you come to get published, and how did you feel when someone said? They loved your manuscript so much they wanted to, to take it on. Oh, it's that finishing point where somebody says that is the most surreal, 
I almost didn't believe it when I read the email. It's such a long journey from from starting to write a book. I mean, this book um, has come through was basically come through Lotopia. This, mm. I started writing this a few years ago, and and it was I worked on it through through the houses of Latopia. Wow. And so, yeah, so this is, it's gone all the way through that and I just honed it and honed it and honed it and it eventually got picked up by an agent and she believed in it and sold it to a great publisher for me. Fabulous. Isn't that brilliant? Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe it. <laughs> what did it feel like to, to see the first copy? Totally surreal. Absolutely surreal. I, I still, it still doesn't feel quite real, even though I'm, I'm sitting here holding my, my book with my name on it and, and all my words that I, that I wrote are in it. I think that the only time it's, I'm going to finally sink in is when I walk into Waterstones and it's on the shelf and I didn't put it there. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us the name and when it's published. The name is The the Zoo and it's published on the 16th of April by Sandstone Press, a great, great little independent publisher. How do people find you on the web? My website is jamiemollart.co.uk. I'm Twitter, I'm at Jamie Mollart. Um, and Facebook, it's Jamie Mollart Author. The Zoo by Jamie Mollett. Published by Sandstone Press. Full details at litopia.tv slash the zoo.